Hello and welcome to our Sunday School Hour. Those of you that are here and those that are watching uh, by the net, we appreciate your attendance and time and hope you've uh, enjoyed our series that we started a couple of weeks ago in the book of Isaiah. We're going to be continuing in that today, in fact, for 13 weeks. And just to fill you in, to kind of catch you up where we were, that first chapter we looked at uh, Isaiah and he had a message to the nation of Israel and Judah that uh, God was going to judge them, and he was going to judge them because of some particular sins. And we talked about those. Those were sins of neglect. They weren't things that they had done, but they had failed to see the people in their society in the right way. They uh, were oppressing the poor. He talked to them about the widows, widows of the day, and he talked to them about the fatherless or the orphans and the way they treated and, and looked after them. And then last week we were in our lesson and we looked at uh, Isaiah's call into the ministry. And we saw that and how he uh, was a prophet that was called to uh, prophesy certain things. And we looked at that. And then today we come to our third lesson and we're in the seventh chapter. I need to give you a little detail of what's taking place here so you will understand. God had told... Judah and Israel, and at this time, it's the divided kingdom, and what we mean by that, there was Israel, Judah was in the south, uh, Israel was in the north, but it's what we know as God's people, they had divided and split at that time, and uh, God had predicted, and he told Isaiah to warn the people that the invasion was coming, it was coming from the Assyrians, he told that parable about a vineyard that he had built and how he had put everything and loved it and nursed it and took care of it and the vineyard uh, produced wild grapes instead of good grapes and God said because of that and because of your behavior and because of your actions judgment is going to come upon this nation now it didn't come that day but it's coming and uh, so it, it, it's a number of years that it passed by that Isaiah is speaking to his nation and to the leaders of his nation, and he is trying to get them to reverse course and to look at things in a different light. Now, I don't know about you, but you're going to see a lot of similarities in this study about Israel and the time and the society that they lived in and the time that we live in. We talked in that first lesson about justice. And we said that people here want justice, and you hear that all the time, that this group, this group, they're oppressed, they need justice. And God spoke about justice, and he talked about a biblical type of justice, and that's why he had such a problem with Israel and how they dealt with the fatherless and the widows and the oppressed, and he, uh, he brought that out. Now, we come to this chapter in chapter 7. I, uh, I struggle with this because I don't want it to just be a history lesson to you. It's about uh, what's taking place. Judah, the king of Judah, Ahaz, and uh, let me just drop in in verse 2. It's not not in your quarterly, it's prior scripture. And it was told unto the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved, and the heart of his people as the trees of the woods are, are moved with the wind. And then in verse 5, because Syria and Ephraim and the sons of Ramallah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make uh, breached therein for us, and sat as a king in the midst of it, he's in the sons of Tabid. What, what is happening here? The Assyrians are coming. They're growing, and, and everybody knows it. All three of these countries know it. Israel, which is referred to as Ephraim, and uh, Judah knows that they're coming. And uh, this other one is a modern-day Syria. They know that the Assyrians are coming, and they're going to come to those places. And so they make an alliance, the northern kingdom of Israel and the king of Aram, modern-day Syria, they make an agreement, and they said, we're going to join forces in the coalition, and we're going to keep the Assyrians out. And they wanted Judah, the southern kingdom, they wanted Judah to join that coalition. Well, King Ahaz, he, uh, he didn't want to do that. And, and they just, and what happens, those two kingdoms above Judah come down and they're going to invade and they're going to force Judah to join that coalition. That's a scene. Let's pick up in what it says. And I want to talk to you a little bit today as we look at this about uh, worry. Worry. 
You know, today we have a problem with people and worry. Uh, we'll, we'll just talk about it, and I want to say this about it. Worry is when you're focusing on the wrong thing. When your mind and your thoughts are on things most of the time that you cannot change, they don't make any difference, they distract you from your worship, they distract you from your relationship with the Lord, they distract you from the good things in your life that can bring encouragement to you. And in verse 7 it says this, Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin, and within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it shall not be a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is a Ramallah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Now, Isaiah brought a word to King Ahaz, and he told him, he said, in, in this thing, in this coalition is, they're, they're trying to force Judah to join that. And, and here's what he says to him. He says in this first verse, it shall not stand. This coalition to stop the Assyrians between the northern kingdom and, and Aram, that it's just not going to stand. God is not going to allow that to, to continue. And, you know, they, they're looking at their own problem, and they see the danger that's out there, and they have an idea, this is how we can fix it. Now, folks, there's a lot of problems in our world today, and a lot of people have ideas about how to fix it, and sometimes they're pretty passionate about it. But God says about this, it is not going to stand. He's telling King Ahaz, and he's telling the people of Israel that don't join that coalition, don't be a part of that, because it's not going to last anyway. And then we get down a little farther in this verse, and he says, And threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it shall not be a people. He's talking about this northern kingdom of Israel. He says, that's 65 years from now, that's going to be broken, and those people are not even going to be a country anymore. That's what he says to them. They're going to be gone. So all the efforts that they're making to deter and to keep God's judgment from coming, they're going to be ineffective, folks. They're not going to be able to do it. And he gives a word to Ahaz and to the nation of, of Judah. He says, if you will not believe... Surely ye shall not be established. Now, in 722 B.C., we, we know some of those events that took place. We know the Assyrians came in. They also took Judah. They demolished the land. And we've talked about in that first lesson that even though they were taken into captivity to the Assyrians, God made a promise to them. He made a promise about a remnant that was going to stay there and be there. And God would continue to bless this nation. But this generation and these people are going to be gone. It reminds me about when they went into the promised land. You remember they left. Egypt and the nation of Israel at that time, or the people of God, the Hebrews, they left and they were headed to the promised land, and they thought they were all going in. But of that generation, how many made it? Two, Joshua and Caleb. That was the only two. God kept his promise, but those folks did not enjoy the promises of God. Now, as we think about this, we, we, we think about uh, Ahaz and his response and the people's response and what has happened before Judah is taken, this northern kingdom of Israel and, and Syria, they are invaded. And the, the Syrians come in and they ravish the land and they take the people into captivity and there's not very much left. And I don't know if you remember the, woman, the Samaritan woman. The, the Samaritans come from when the Assyrians take that land. All the people are gone except just a few. And they intermarry and they created a race of people in Jesus' day that were called the Samaritans. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They hated them because they didn't feel like they were full-blooded Jews. They were half Assyrian and half Jewish. And so we, we kind of know some of that from the New Testament, those problems that came about. Well, let's look at Ahaz's response. God's calling on him to, to, to uh, Isaiah to speak to him. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it in either depth or in height above. He says, Ahaz, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. You know, the Bible tells us we ought not to pray for signs, but when God offers to give one, I don't know about you, but I think I'd say yes. I think I'd want to know what God has to say. But look at Ahaz's response. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. 
And he said, Hear ye, O now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to do to weary men, but will you also weary my God? Isaiah says to him, uh, Ahaz, you, you know, you just don't believe. He is, a, he is a godless leader. He won't listen. He won't take the advice. He won't seek God. And uh, Isaiah has had about all he can stand to that. He says, will you weary me? And he's talking about himself. And will you weary God also? God wants to help. God has offered these people uh, a, a, a way out. He's offered them redemption. He's asked them to repent of their sins. He will restore. He will prevent the judgment from coming. But there is just an attitude about these people that he will will not. God offers to increase our faith all the time, folks. He offers not so much in signs, but he offers, and that's what he wants to do, is to increase our faith in him so we don't have to worry and be troubled and bothered and get through life. God didn't just save you. He saved you, but he also wants to be a part of your life, to enhance your life, to make it better, to give you purpose, to give you all those good things that he wants to give. Ahaz refuses that, and he he says, we can handle this ourselves, okay? That's really what he's saying. I don't have time for that. Well, let's look at some of the promises. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Ahaz didn't want a sign, but Isaiah said, God's going to give you a sign. He's going to give it to the people, and he's going to give it to everybody. Here's what he says. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, you and I know that because when you go over to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 23, you'll find that the writer there, Matthew, says that is a fulfillment of the prophecy when Jesus was born of that that the prophet Isaiah spoke about. So we know that that's what he's talking about, first of all. But you know, God can say a lot of things at one time. He can say a lot of things at one time. He's trying to encourage these people of that day to, that that invasion is coming, but he has a plan and he has a way out and he will save them if they will look to him. He's saying to you and me today that 700 years ago, he saw the problem that exists in our hearts and lives and he has a remedy for that too and he planned it and he put it in there. And as we think about this, this sign is such a wonderful thing. Now, you know, people wonder about salvation. I spoke a little bit about this past week. You see Jesus in the Old Testament all the time, folks. This is one you can't help but see because it's the virgin birth. And we know that Jesus is the only one that fulfills that prophecy. But these people, the, the hope that he's given them is that they will look forward and see that God is not going to completely annihilate them. He will save them today if they will allow him, but they don't. And he's staying to those faithful, those, that remnant of people, I have something for you, something in the future, and I'm not going to forget you. Now, in the New Testament, there are things that God tells us like, I'll never leave you, or what? Forsake you. I'm not going to do that. It doesn't matter how much trouble comes. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. I'm not going to leave you if you're one of my children, and I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to be with you. So why should we worry, and why should we fret about those things? Now, there's kind of a double interpretation for this, and some... Uh, uh, commentaries will talk about Isaiah. He had a son. He had a son in two years from this time. And this time frame is, is kind of, it's like he answered Isaiah's prayer. He answered the situation then. He answered the fulfillment of what we need today in Jesus Christ. And he just does it all at one time. Folks, I'm one dimensional. And sometimes I'm not good at that. You know, I mean, what I say just don't. But when God says something, you know, he, he knows from the beginning from the end. And he can say something that applies to three different groups of people. He doesn't have any problem doing that. And that's exactly what happened here. Now look at verse 15. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. He's talking about a time frame about Isaiah's son that's going to be born. He's talking about that this, this child is going to grow up in, in, in a short time, two to four years. He's going to quit eating the, the baby food, and he's going to start eating some of those other things. He's also talking about the fact that these things are going to be in great supply because there's not going to be very many people here, folks. They're going to be taken into captivity. Well, look at the 
16th verse, and I want you to see something in it. For, this child, for before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou harvest shall be forsaken of both of her kings. Now he's saying to Isaiah, this son that's going to be born to you, before that son gets old enough to, when he gets old enough to choose food, you know, when they're babies, they just eat anything. I, I know about uh, three, four years old, I, our, our grandkids, they get pretty picky, don't they? They don't want just anything. They just kind of pick out what they want. Well, he is saying by that time, look, both of these kings, they're going to be forsaken. It's going to be over with. This coalition that you're so worried about, Ahaz, in just a short time, it's not going to amount to anything. Now, we've got to stop here. We've said worry. We ought not to worry. Well, we ought not to worry about the wrong things. That's the second thing you need to see. You see, Ahaz was worried about things that God is saying. You're worried about that, but it's not going to come to pass anyway. All those thoughts, ideas that Ahaz had that he thought his enemy was a northern kingdom, it was not the northern kingdom. And God said that problem that you perceive to be so bad, that's not the problem. And so what he's, what's happening here, he's worried about the wrong thing. You think we're worried in America about the wrong thing, folks? We were worried about the wrong things. And I'll tell you what will happen in your life. You'll get to be worried about the wrong things, and you'll forsake and miss the things that you ought to be. And all this lesson is about here, God is trying to offer redemption and save these people. He's trying to save them from the calamity that's about to come, and he's just doing it in a way, and they... Time after time, they refuse. And instead of their focus on him, the solution to the problem, all they can see is a problem. And I'm going to tell you, folks, that's when we get in trouble. When you stand around and look at the problems that you have, and most of them you can't solve, you can't do anything about them, by the end of the day, you think about those, and you're not fit for much, are you? I mean, it will wear you down. You worry about your children, your grandchildren, you worry about the virus, you worry about this, you worry about that, you just worry, you know? And what happens when we do that? What's happening is the time that we're worrying about those, we're, we ought to be focused on him, and they're getting our attention, and we're getting weaker and weaker in our faith, and our problems get bigger and bigger, and no wonder we can't cope. Ahaz is a picture of the way most people respond. He's worried about something that is not going to come to pass. Let's go a little farther and look at this. And uh, I, I want to start back up here. They're going to refuse the evil and choose the good. The land that thou horest shall be forsaken of both her kings. He's talking about that northern kingdom in Syria. They're, they're going to, it's going to happen to them. You're worried about them coming down here and invading you? No, you don't have to worry about that. They ain't going to be there. They're not going to be there in a short period of time, about two to four years. And he says to them, they have forsaken both her kings. God's judgment it is prophesied to come at the hands of this Syria. He is saying to them, King Ahaz and Israel and Judah at this time, you got it all wrong. You're worried about an enemy that is not your, the enemy that you're going to have to deal with. Now, our problem, I, I think today in America, we, we are so divided, aren't we? We have so many issues that divide our nation. You see it in a political year. You see it all the time. But we have those things that divide us. They capture our attention. They capture the attention of the ungodly and the godly. We focus on that instead of on the solution. We do the same thing. They can't hear God because they're so busy about their life and their problems and the things that are going on that they don't have time to hear him, folks. And I, I'm, I'm just afraid that's where we are. We, we don't have peace. Uh, I, let's go a little farther, and I'll explain that, okay? The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come. He is saying this is in the future. From the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. The Syrians are coming, and that's what he ought to be worried about. First of all, we see the worry that takes a time away from the good things in life that we ought to be focusing on, from our Lord and Savior and from good things. We focus on the bad things. Then we focus on things that are not going to come to pass. That's what they're doing here. They're focusing on the wrong things. And, folks, that's where we're at today. We, we have a solution. We have, a, we have an answer to the problem in this world, but we're not focused on it. We're focused on the problem. And then the third thing, 
thing down here that we see is that they're failing to worry about the right thing. God is trying to say to them all the way through this, folks, your relationship with me is not right. Your relationship with your fellow man is not right. And that's what I've been trying to tell you. And, and here you see the storm clouds gather, and you see things that are going to come about, and you're worried about them. That's not going to fix your problem. You can't handle that enemy to start with, okay? You can't take care of that enemy. You think you can change this world? <laughs> you think you can change this world? No, you can only change yourself, folks. And you can only share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so some of these things that we worry about, listen to the conversation just in the, out in the world, in, in the workplace, at the job, at school. It's all about the problems and the things that we have. There is no talk about solutions. Well, you're wondering, uh, are you sure about that? Well, you know how much... The helplines in America, we have helplines everywhere. You know how much the call into the helplines has gone up in the last while? Anybody want to guess? Try 891% increase in the hotlines and the helplines in America. I can tell you, people are worried, aren't they? People have problems. People are focused on their problem, and they're doing exactly what Israel did. They, they don't seek the source of their help, and I believe, I'll tell you the truth, my personal belief is God is saying to us the same thing he's saying to them. Your problem is not your problems. Your problems is your relationship with me. It's your relationship with your fellow man. It's a relationship, and it's you that's a problem. Problem is not those out there. You can't change those out there, but you can change you. And I think that's what he's saying to them, and that's what I think he's saying to us, folks. These people worried about the wrong thing, and God is saying to them, the Syrians are coming. 65 years from the time he started, he keeps warning and warning and warning, and you think that they would finally listen. You listen today, and you ask people, what's the biggest problem that we'll have in America? Some will say China's a big problem. Some will say the racial injustice here in America is the biggest problem that we have. Some will say, I don't know about these elections, whether they're going to be fair and upbeat. We, we need this, we need this, we need this. Folks, God is saying to us, and I believe he's saying it through this passage today, that is not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is something that you can change, and it's you, and it's your attitude towards me, and it's your attitude towards your fellow man. That's, that's what it is. When you get to the New Testament, folks, he boiled it down. We're going to talk about this. We'll probably talk about it a lot more. He boiled it down to two things. Here are the two greatest commandments. You love me with all your heart, mind, and soul. You've got to get that one right first or you can't do the second one. Okay? If you don't love him like that, you can't do the second. And the second, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the way you do it. Love God and love your neighbor. And when you look at the problems today, here's where it comes from. It comes from a lack of love. It comes from a lack of compassion. It comes from greed because we're thinking about ourselves. We're not thinking about other people. And the problem is the same. You would think the United States, we are so far advanced in so many things that we wouldn't really have the same problem that Israel's having, but it's exactly the same problem, isn't it? Well, we have the COVID, and we got this, and we got, we got China, and we got... Well, they had all those things too, folks. Syrians were just as big to them as China or Russia is to us. Same thing, same thing. They had internal problems. They had starvation. They had sickness. They had all those. None of that has changed. But the Bible is clear in one thing. He says to us that there is one thing, and he inserts this verse 14. It almost seems like it's out of place. He says this, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. What's this sign all about, and what is it to you? To those people, he was saying, in, in, in a general sense, Israel's not going to listen. They're not going to change, and I'm going to send judgment. And the Assyrians are going to come here, and they're going to wipe this place out, and they're going to take the people in captivity. That's what he says to them. But there are some that are trying, folks, and there are some that are faithful to God. And here's what he says to them. He's saying, but you, but you, listen to this sign. There is one coming. And this nation of Israel is not going to be down forever because I'm going to send a Savior, and I'm going to send a remnant. And the picture in Isaiah is it like you cut a bush down, and you prune it, and you prune it all the way to the ground. And I had to do some roses that were infected with fungus not long ago, and I flattened them to the ground. Carol told me to, and I said, are you sure you want them down that low to the ground? All the way down. Whack them down. And I looked, and they were dead. They were dead for about... 
three weeks, and then finally the little bud comes up, little piece come up out of that. And God is saying to them, that's what's going to happen. You be faithful. You be true. You keep your focus on what you need to do, and I'm going to take care of things. Folks, we, can't, there, we worry about things that we can't change. First of all, I can't change anybody. Can you? Can you? <laughs> I can't. I can't change a single person. All I can change is me. And, and really, it boils down to this. God is saying, if each one of you will do what you're supposed to do, according to me, and commit yourself and love me and make that the priority of your life, I'll take care of things. I'll take care of you. I, I heard Max Licato, he is one this morning, that wrote a new book, and he said that about the helpline, 891%. People are troubled, folks, and they need some hope. God has placed it here. He put that verse right there. And i tell you what our hope is. That nation looked back to or looked forward to the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Our hope is to look back when Jesus Christ came and when he died for us. It's the focus. Well, let's bow for our prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. And, Lord, this history lesson that we've looked at in the nation of Israel and Judah, we see the mistakes that they made. And, Lord, it's interesting how we just seem to be going down exactly the same path. We, we focus on things that are not important. We focus on things we cannot change. We worry about things that are not going to come to pass. And I pray that you'll help us to see the importance. And the lesson today is just simply place your faith, your trust, turn your eyes on Jesus, and, and live your life and let him fight our battles for us. Lord, we won't worry. We'll have peace. We'll have contentment. We'll have purpose in our life if we'll just allow you to do that. I'm so glad that you loved us. I'm so glad you didn't judge us and wipe us out and that you kept that remnant there. And Lord, you have faithful today that are going to be faithful to you to the end. And I know that just, just as that promise applies, you've made promises to us. I pray that you'll help us to see the things we ought to be doing in the time that we live. Accept our love, praise, and worship today. We ask it in the name of our Savior, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.